You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Welcome back to the show, and I apologize for this being late. Um, I was intending to record the whole thing last night, wild camping at the top of a cliff. I was in my tent, ready to go. The I was actually overlooking a quite a noisy beach, you know, so I was a bit worried about the sound anyway. And also I had in mind that somebody had mentioned that the sound of my show recently has been pretty crappy. Um, I had had brought with me a ridiculously expensive microphone to do the shows, and unfortunately I didn't learn how to use it before it came out. I had come up with an idea of how to improve the sound tonight, um, but the mic (laughs) needed charging. So I I tried to do it with my plug-in Apple headset, and that just didn't work at all. So I had to abandon the thought of releasing the show as the normal time, which is 3 a.m. on a Thursday morning. It's now hopefully later on a Thursday and with a bit of luck I would have done this recording. Um, I still don't know as I'm just recording the first segment right now. I'd like to thank all of you who've donated to Parenting Matters. I had a lovely email sent um, to me from our Chief Executive at Parenting Matters from one of you lovely people who received a photo of me on the beach thanking her. You know who you are. Um, So thanks again for writing such a really such a humbling beautiful email about my hike and and parenting matters but let's get on now and hear what happened on day number 15. day number 15 tintagel to port isaac nine miles which means we've done about 155 miles in all this day was all about the rain and the wind We'd been remarkably lucky since I started with John back on April the 15th. I was told quite early on that it had rained, started raining sometime in November and hadn't stopped. So when I started the hike on April 15th, it was raining that morning for about two minutes. And if you remember, I went back into the hotel, had my breakfast, and it didn't rain after that at all. That's not true. I think we may have had a few few drops one afternoon. There was one, one wettish afternoon, but generally we've had remarkably good weather. And I was leaving Richard and Wendy on this day, so I'd had the comfort of staying every night at theirs for about five nights, I think it was. And the forecast for the next two days, my first two days away from them, was for rainy weather. I... Had, we, we had I'd, uh, had breakfast at a farm shop on the way. And I said to them, you know, let's go and have, go out and have breakfast, then we can head out to Tintagel and get started. And I've got to tell you, these farm shops, and there's a number of them I've seen so far, they seem to expand from just being a regular cafe to um, have little parts of them uh, sell, sell gear, um, pottery, and all sorts of little things that you can buy. And it's a good use of a farm shop, and the breakfast, so I thoroughly enjoyed that. So I'd say goodbye. Um, my friends who've been friends for a long, long time, they dropped me at the top of the hill. And if you recall, the previous day, I'd come from the bottom of Tintagel to the top by this clapped-out old rain, uh, Land Rover. Um, it was, it was um, £2.50 to save the really steep walk up the hill, and I was glad I was doing it. And so for another two pound fifty, I got the steep, got rid of the steep walk down the hill again, so I could start walking again. And at the bottom, it started to rain, and I, I don't know, I think some of my insecurities came back again. Um, so I went into the coffee shop, even though I'd already just had a coffee, obviously from what I'd eaten, and um, <laughs> I had another coffee. I was really hoping to wait out the rain. So eventually, 
Um, I started at 11.30. The wind at the top was especially fierce and about as fierce as I've, I've ever experienced wind actually on a hike. As always, when a stream or river needed to be negotiated, the trail would drop down, often precipitously, head on up the other side. And fortunately, because of this wind, and that was concerning me quite often, particularly near the edge of the uh, coast path, the, um, the, fortunately those downs were much less severe, while the ups felt easy, more easy than previously. And I've noticed that our, I think, I think our main climbing that we've done so far happened in those earlier days, and I think it's definitely becoming easier to gauge how far you've got to go uh, down and also how far you've got to go up. And none of these climbs have concerned me at all, other than in the wind and rain. And you know, and this is any this this is true anywhere I think. With wind and rain, the trail tends to take on a whole new character. And I often felt, and I often do feel, that I'm bat not not only am I battling the trail, but I'm battling the elements. And with that new character of trail, I find the battle, frankly, to be quite tough. And I certainly did on this particular day. I ran into a family of four from Holland as they came up behind me, of course, and then passed me. And from then on, they were always in my sight. It's surprising how comforting it is to see other hikers when the weather is highlighting your inadequacies. The two sons waited back for me um, when I came to a, this, um, I think they call them the kissing gate, where you go in one side and then close the gate and lock the gate and then go out the other side. Um, they were going to suggest to me a better route into a field as the entry through the gate was under about a foot of water and I did not want to put my feet <laughs> under a foot of water at that stage. I may have taken the route they suggested anyway, but it was reassuring to have them. In the end, I kind of shimmied along this, well, I felt like I was walking on a hedge. It was very uh, exposed. Um, and I... And I could see to my left, which is where I had to get into the field, um, it was lined with a barbed wire fence. So I knew at some stage I was going to have to put my feet on that barbed wire fence. Um, and I I had to rest my arm on a post. And I trusted that the uh, fence or the, the barbed wire would hold my weight. And I flipped over the top and jumped down five feet. Trust me, I'm not built to do that, um, but it worked. I didn't fall over, didn't get my feet wet, and uh, thanks to the, the guys from Holland for helping me out there. With with the rain, of course, comes slippery, you know, slippery conditions. I've already fallen once on slippery conditions, and of course, I fell over again. Absolutely no damage, but of course, I shouted out, number two, once I realised I was okay. It wasn't a bad one. I actually fell on my back. and I thought I heard something crunch in my backpack. Um, but I couldn't find anything broken later on in the day. Uh, when I looked at my boots later, and this this is moving ahead a bit, um, I was quite disappointed to see how worn the back part of my sole had become. And this may be a problem going forward. I've only got 200, no, about 150 miles, 160 miles on these oboes. And oboes are my, always my go-to boot. Kind of disappointed that that's worn so badly so far but you know it's, it's been quite a tough climb in many ways and so you know the boots take a take a, a knocking i'd already decided that i was going to stay the night in port isaac mainly because setting up a tent would have been almost impossible i mean if, even if it wasn't for the wind the rain rather putting it setting up a tent in the wind it is most impossible i asked dana to check some options for me but she went ahead and booked right in Port Isaac, um, which was way more expensive than I wanted to spend, but I was very grateful for it. And incidentally, this is the village in the TV show Doc Martin. I don't know whether you've seen it. Um, pretty little um, seaside village and houses close together, nice colours. Um, it's a really cute little village. I stopped at the Golden Lion pub, absolutely drenched. Nobody seemed at all offended by this, <laughs> this sodden 70-year-old. Uh, 
uh, sitting in front of the fire and I'm sure the steam was rising off me. I had so much water on me and I warmed myself up by that fire for about an hour. It was absolutely wonderful. Thoroughly enjoyed that. And so then I thought, well, how far is this place that Dana's booked for me? She told me it was 1.6 miles off trail and I was dreading another 1.6 mile walk out there in the rain. So I checked Google Maps and it was about 100 yards away. <laughs> Happy days. I was very relieved. Um, place at a bath, so of course I jumped in that and, um, and had a really nice dinner. And so it really led to a successful stop and the end of day number, let me check, 15. Day 16, Port Isaac to Polzath, 9.5 miles, which means 164 miles in all. This was projected to be, and in fact was, another wet and windy day. So the wind was far lighter than the day before. It made a considerable difference. You know, I've always said that the waterproofs aren't, um, are only waterproof for about, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, and then you start having dampness in there. But when you can walk your way through um, rain, you can tend to dry out yourself. Your body just stays warm, and you can, if the rain stops for a little bit, you tend to dry out a little bit. And this happened today in many ways. I was in the uh, hotel in Port Isaac and came down for breakfast about 8.30, and once again, I was in absolutely no hurry to get away. Um, this this hike, and all hikes, in fact, are so much worse than the wind and the rain. I mean, it's exciting for a little while, but frankly, I'd far rather be walking on a nice sunny day, or at least a, a not rainy day. I met my Dutch friends again. They'd stayed there. And I met Brian, the Guernsey guy. He's much faster than me, but he takes the odd day off, which is why we're still in and around the same place. He's actually taking days, he, he, he's not camping out at all. I just certain I'm hardly camping out myself at the moment, as you can tell. Um, but he's um, taking days off here and there and kind of having a relaxed way of walking the path. He, he walks 20 mile days, um, which I probably do over two days, but he does it in one day and then takes the next day off. Interesting way to do it, I guess. The plan was to get to Padstow, catching the ferry from Rock by 5.45. Yeah, because the last the last, uh, the last, last ferry goes at 5.45. But my 11 a.m. start, see, even when I'm not camping, it took me two and a half hours from breakfast to get out. Um, my 11 a.m. start made that somewhat unlikely. There were plenty of ups and downs to slow me, but without testing me too much. The wet got through my waterproofs pretty quickly, um, and I expected it, obviously. Um, I, I, but I never felt uncomfortable on this day. I felt like um, I, I knew what I was doing. I, I knew how to cope with it. And in the breaks between the rain, I felt like my warmth in my body came back and I was, I was going quite well. And I was planning that the, or hoping rather, and, and expecting for the rain uh, to stop in the afternoon so that I could camp. Um, I'm, you know, with only two nights in my tent so far, the costs are definitely mounting and I can't afford really to be staying in hotels all that often. Apparently the better weather is due to arrive in about five days time. We're just going to have to see how it works out. Um, the first target was a little um, National Trust village called Port Quinn. I was hopeful, of course, of finding a cafe or a pub. Um, and I, the, the path on the way to uh, Port Quinn was is described as a roller coaster of a path in the in the guide. And I noticed it went really close to the edge as it moved up and down. Um, as I say, it's a National Trust village, but there are there are no shops at all. Um, so it's basically just I don't even know what they're for these buildings but um i just headed on and beyond port Quinn, the path goes through more pasture so with regular dips uh, to streams and bridges as, as they nearly always have been so far as i headed towards the 
gorgeous beach of Polzar. I was still expecting and hoping to camp, but as I was thinking about it, and this often happens to me, when I think about something, some, you know, something that I'm thinking about happens, the rain hit harder than ever. I'd already dried out at that point, but the new dowsing got me damp immediately. At that point, I knew I was done for the day, and I popped into a cafe where I saw my Dutch friends again. They were continuing to padstow and left me look and left me looking for affordable accommodation somewhere. I eventually found a pub about five miles away in Wadebridge. Padstow is a very expensive place, so all the areas around Padstow are quite expensive. And I need to get some value for money. Then I tried to get a cab. That was a bit of a mission as well, but I eventually procured one and got into Wade. Uh, Wade Bridge and, and this pub. Spent the evening um, in the pub restaurant, which was good. Um, had a drink and, and a decent dinner and had a good night's sleep. So um, once again, I'm, I'm, in, I'm having a good time. I'm not camping as much as I'd like to. And um, I, that needs to change at some stage in, in, in the near future. But that was the end of day number 16. Day number 17, Polzath, we're just outside Porth Coffin, about 16 miles, although my um, watch registered over 17 miles and 35,000 steps, <laughs> which is a total of about 180 miles. I tried to get the bus back in the morning, <laughs> but the woman behind reception had given me the wrong info on the first bus. The first bus, she told me, was at 8.37. I was there dutifully at 8.30, I think it was. And I looked at the, the itinerary, or the schedule rather, and it said uh, 9.37. Not helpful. Um, so I started looking around for a cab, and I found that quite difficult to get yet again. You'd think people would, there would be more cabs around, actually. You know, it, it's more and more difficult. I did actually see one, in a cab waiting area, but they said they couldn't run me there till 11. Quite what they were doing at that stage, and not being able to run me there till 11, I don't know. But she did give me a number of a guy called Mark, who dutifully came along about 10, 10 minutes later and took me back to where I'd been before. And where I'd been before was this, this um, crab sort of cafe. Uh, he dropped me by the, um, by the entrance to the car park. And I walked back down and resumed my, my hike. And on this day, I had only a few miles to go to rock for the boat across to Pesto. And it was a nice, easy, um, comfortable walk. A bit of weather again, of course, because we'd, we'd had, had some rain. Um, and with the, the day's profile being fairly easy, I hoped to get to Port Cotton by the end of the day, which was still some 16 trail miles away. The path to rock... Um, you, you, you're around uh, two headlands uh, on the way, walk across the beach a little bit, which is quite nice, um, and you go up around another um, headland to walk down into the, the slip where the ferry was actually waiting for me, which was great. Uh, the boat filled up. The back, it was. There must have been about 50 of us on it. It looked dangerous to me. Uh, and, and we headed off to towards Padstow. Now, in Padstow, there was a May Day celebration and there were people milling around and a, and a, um, there was a, what do you call it, a parade going on. And I don't like that sort of stuff. There's too many people around. And once I'm in hiking mode, I just want to hike. I don't want to be around people. But there was something I had to do. The previous night, I'd taken out my various gear to dry it all off. And my waterproofs, <laughs> I think I, I now work out what the sound was when I fell on my back. My waterproof trousers, or you know, the my, my over trousers, as it were, had split all the way up <laughs> the back. <laughs> that must be a lovely sight. Um, and so they were completely useless. I went into a shop just inside Padstow um, called I can't remember what it's called now Mountain Hardware. That's right, and um, bought some 
what they call over trousers, the cheapest ones they had, were, I think about 16, 17 pounds. And they worked fine. And so I bought those and headed out. On this um, hike, there were only two climbs of any real effort. As it, it feels to me like the coast has kind of lowered a little bit. And trail is definitely easier and flatter. But the views are still sensational. And we went round two remote heads, including Travaux's head and its beautiful lighthouse. I I came here, oh, I don't know, oh yes, it was 30 years ago this, this year, in fact, playing golf with some friends. And Travaux's head, I remember seeing it at the time, and it looked remote. I wasn't doing any hiking at that time. I was basically drinking. <laughs> and so the, the thought of coming back here after all these years was kind of tantalizing for me. I did actually consider staying there for the night because the path took me to a quiet, really quiet spot that was elevated and we were expecting rain overnight so picking a good spot could have been important now i know you i know you're thinking i'm not going to be camping tonight but i, I do so <laughs> just let you know quite early in that hike out of padstow i went through a cow field now i've told you before um that some of the Facebook groups talk about people scared of going through cow fields. And I wasn't until <laughs> I started reading about reading some of these posts. Um, and seven people get killed every year by cows in the UK. This isn't great, is it really? Well, like four of them are, uh, um, are farm workers. But I got in there. Um, they all looked up at me again. I wish I wouldn't do that. It's very, you, you're very aware you're walking in their space. But I gave him a pretty wide berth. And, but one of them was looking over and looking over and started to wander closer. So I started singing the Seven Dwarfs song. I ho <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And she backed off. That was good. I continued my singing <laughs> all the way past past this cow she kept looking at me and uh i got through with no problem at all of course i got through with no problem at all i kind of wish i hadn't read some of these these comments on facebook but i was going really well and i felt like i'd hit a groove um yesterday and the miles were coming easier than, than i expected and this happens on i think on most hikes you know you're you got the, you get the tiredness in your legs but once you get moving you were able to make that progress easier than you had done a few days before. I don't know what, how it happens, but it just does. And having done just two days previously of eight and nine miles, or whatever it was, ten, eight, nine or ten miles, I, I did, today actually I put, I say, 15 or 16 on, on my legs, and I had no problem with it at all. I reached Constantine Beach, and their fantastic serving beach. As was Trianon Beach about 15 minutes later. Constantine Beach had no coffee or no cafe, rather, or pub. I mean, I would like to stop at these places if I can. It allows me to recharge my devices, allows me to recharge myself, to be honest with you. Um, and on Trianon Beach, about 15 minutes later, I stopped in at the youth hostel and had a quick beer. Who should walk in? But my Dutch friends. And <laughs> we seem to have the same idea of where is a good place to stop. They were staying night. I stand the night there and I said goodbye because they've, they've been fellow travellers and I'm, I'm going to miss them. I didn't really fancy the youth hostel. And as I say, I want I really wanted a, a camp uh, last night. I feel that it's, I feel it's important for me to do this because not only to justify the cost of, of doing this trip, but I enjoy camping. I genuinely enjoy camping. So I found my way um, walking down into Porth Cothan and found what I thought was, it was exposed, but there wasn't much wind at the time. Um, it was a really good spot. So I set up my chair at first um, because people were still out walking and, and I was reading my reading my book uh, on my chair and people would chat to me. One guy sat down and chatted to me for about 20 minutes. Um, a lot of them were locals. 
And they said, oh, yeah, you'll be fine staying here. I said, are you sure you're okay staying here? The weather's not going to be very good tonight. Well, I thought it would be okay. So I set up my tent and started recording, and that's when all the problems happened with my recordings. I did a live video, Facebook video, and um, posted that I would not be able to put the show up um, in, at the normal time. But it was a it was a glorious experience to be sitting on that cliff top, overlooking the bay, the sound of the surf below, the gulls all rushing by, and and no one around. And as the sun went down, I was recording it going. I wasn't in the least bit nervous. I had that feeling that you know I I know where I am. This is what I can do, and um, I I slept really really well until I don't know about three o'clock actually this morning because I'm now recording on Thursday um, the rain started so I'll probably take it up from there but that is the end of day number seventeen. <laughs> So there you have it. Three days out from my friends. And <laughs> I've restayed indoors twice. But I think it will be the nights that I stay outdoors that will stay with me. The feeling of self-sufficiency is powerful. And I know that this is something I can do pretty well. Let's face it. I stayed, I don't know, I don't know, 120, 120 odd nights out when I did the Appalachian Trail in, in 2019. I'm not nervous um, and there's something I, I get anyway, this feeling of calm when I'm going to be staying in my tent. I know my tent and the various adjustments I need to make from time to time to keep myself um, getting wind from the direction I don't want it and rain and just making sure I'm comfortable and dry in the tent. And I actually enjoy making a freeze-dried meal and a hot chocolate from time to time. The nights indoors are great for my well-being and recharging and all those other good things. But it's the outdoor adventures that give me what I need from hiking. I'll see you next time.